Uh, Claire, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, it's a real treat to have you along. Now, um, I remember talking to you about the ideas that we had for Campaign for Common Sense just before lockdown kicked in. Um, and we sort of agreed that there was probably a need for, for um, you know, another set of voices in the arena about how to disagree. So when I came to um, think about the topic for tonight, it seemed only right that we, um, we badge your event as how to disagree with Claire Fox, even though you and I have never really had a big disagreement about stuff because yeah. we're normally moaning about the world and everything that's, that's um, going on. Um, but I just thought to, to get started off this evening, um, a bit of a nice soft question to get going with things, which is like, you've been involved in education for years, you know, you were a teacher and whatnot, I was a teacher for years, and normally people that get involved in education had an interesting time at school themselves. And often how they were at school informs and shapes what they go on to do. So what was your favourite kind of thing you got up to at school? So, yeah, I mean, I, I um, English was my favourite subject and that's what I went on to study afterwards. But I suppose I was uh, even then a bit of a, both an organiser and a troublemaker in equal <laughs> measure. So I was kind of like, I did lots of sort of worthy good things like, you know, visiting care homes and, you know, kind of lots of voluntary work. And I organized yeah. lots of, you know, fundraisers for charities, all that you can imagine. I was kind of completely painful um, and sort of kind of, you know, in that kind of like worthy. Yeah. Uh, uh, that um, dangerous combination. Exactly. I, I, idealistic. But, but, the, but the sort of troublemaker bit, the, the, you know, first of all, I, I, I'll show you how old I, I, I am, that I was kind of, because I, I went to a school that had previously been a, a secondary modern, so it had become a comprehensive, so it's going up in the world, but it does give you a bit of a flavour, um, and it was pretty tough school, and I kind of, you know, I was kind of very, uh, in, enjoyed being matey with lots of some of, some of the hard kids, um, and I, I once wrote uh, Fox's rule, I mean, it's original, when I was 12, I scraped it on the desk and uh, oh, I actually so got, the, but I actually got the cane for that. Um, oh, okay. I, I then got into a very big fight in my uh, second year, as it was then, when I was like 12 or 13, because I decided that I would do the job of defending someone who was being bullied. But I didn't really know what I was doing, really. So I didn't realise that she was being bullied by this really hard gang. And I decided that I would tell the hard gang that I would defend the person being bullied and then walked out into the playground and everyone was shouting, scrap, scrap. And I thought, who's having a scrap? And then I realised it was it me. Was you. <laughs> the fortunate thing about that was that I actually won the fight, I think out of sheer terror and mm -hmm. my reputation as being somewhat not as goody two shoes as they thought was, uh, you know, kind of went on. To, so that that's the kind of thing I did. <laughs> so, 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 what, so what was it, what, can, looking back now, what were the reasons why you were always so interested in, you know, doing stuff, campaigning, trying to change things, improve things? Was, was there anything you could think about that could set you off down that route? It's harder, isn't it? It's, it's a harder route to take. I don't, I mean, I think, I, 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 I can't really remember, but I have to give credit to my parents, really. I, they talked about, they weren't, they weren't formally well-educated, well but they were both very, uh, you know, interested in current affairs. I've often said this about yeah. them, you know, there was lots of arguments over, over politics in the house. I didn't know it was in politics, really. They, they, you know, we all watched Panorama, you know, my dad would read out things in the newspaper and say, yeah. my God, what do we think of that? We'd all talk about it. Um, and also, I think Irish Catholic families, you know, we were outsiders to a certain extent, rather self-consciously, mm -hmm. you know, immigrants, uh, or they were, and they were kind of, um, so you had a kind of slightly different perspective when you looked at society, you were kind of trying to understand certain things. And also Catholics spend the whole time, um, despite what people think that you spend the whole time being indoctrinated in Catholic schools, you actually spend the whole time talking about morality. And when you spend the whole time talking about morality, trying to work out what's right and wrong, you actually start thinking about it. So, you know, any number of those different things um, made me interested in the world. And so, you know, that, that, that was it, really. And also because it was, 
I could see, you know, I'm from a, I, 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 you know, I'm not from a kind of, uh, you know, uh, I'm from a, an upper working class background, of my, you know, aspiring middle class. And I went, I stayed on and went to sixth form and I went to university and that was quite, that was unusual both for the school and the local area. So I sort of thought of myself as being somebody who was privileged because I was relatively mm -hmm. speaking. Most of my friends left school at 15 and went to work. And so I suppose I had some sense of the injustices in the world. I had some sense of um, different ways that people lived. It's really interesting you mentioned the sort of Irish Catholic thing because um, I'm, I'm not from an Irish background any time recently, but I was one of eight kids, so a massive family. And um, my, my mum was a really, really traditional Catholic, so Latin mass and, you know, women covering their head in church and so on. So um, that automatically made me feel like an outsider, even though we had lots and lots of friends and we always all got on really, really well at school. Just coming from that very different context makes you feel different. And for me, I think it meant... You know, like you said, you were talking about morality. One of the other things I realised was we were always having to very subtly justify why we were different. Yeah, yeah. If you come from a big family or if you're a very Catholic family or whatever. And of course, I suppose nowadays people might call that microaggressions if people are always asking me, why do you do that? Well, and actually, it's probably led to me being the annoying person I am now. And that's I've always been quite comfortable disagreeing with people or having a different view with people because that's what I grew up with. And I don't know, if, was that a similar thing for you or were you surrounded by people that felt the same way as you no no I, I think that was the thing was you were very conscious i mean um in those days being a, a, a from an irish catholic background i mean i went to an i went to a catholic school i went i was from a catholic community but we were i you know we were stood out as being different and yeah. you had to get on a bus to go to school because you didn't have a local school and all that sort of thing yeah. and people called you names i mean you know I, it's not to go on about it but it was the days when being Irish um, in the in Britain wasn't straightforward, um, and uh, you were quite defensive about that. But I think it was much more that you know you often hear this from actually from immigrants from all around the world that you know it was instilled in us that we kind of had to no one was going to do us any favors. You know we mm -hmm. had to do it mm -hmm. ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. That was the sense of self education you know you, and also that we didn't have the advantages you know so yeah. it was an encouragement to be uh, ambitious but it was very much up against it you know and so the, the teachers attitudes were nobody thinks anyone from this school can do anything but I, we're going to prove them wrong aren't we you know what i mean and yeah. you know not very many people have gone to university from you know from the, this school in flint but but we're going to really push to get a few of you through and people think that people in this area are not interested in literature. That's wrong, isn't it? So it was a very aspirational atmosphere, yeah. but in a context of thinking that we were not, um, you know, we were not, we were, we were not walking into anything easily, and we didn't. And uh, you know, my my parents, I realise much more now, but my uh, they they struggled in order to allow us to have the life that we had there was nothing came easy they had to work bloody hard and I can imagine how annoying I was because I went off to university became a lefty and then would come back and lecture my father on the evils of capitalism mm -hmm. um, and obviously he would just sit there you know kind of like yeah. God, what a nuisance she's turned out to be that, that very capitalism which had given you know enabled him exactly. to put bread on the table oh yeah but I'd yeah. also tell him that you know it was unfair and he had to give more, you know he had to make sure that he was um, on the side of the working class and the oppressed, you know. You can imagine <laughs> the, Warwick, the Warwick University 18-year-old, and my dad had come from the, 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 uh, the, the roughest part of Dublin, and uh, he didn't really yeah, need yeah. me lecturing him on uh, what it felt like to have nothing. But anyway, I, this yeah. is a traditional story of, 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 of daughters and fathers and know-it-all teenagers that's been going on for some time. Well, I'm experiencing that now. I've got four daughters of my own and the oldest is 14 and the next one's 12. And um, I'm really reaping the benefits of them having a good education because they're really taking me on and putting me in my place all the time. So, OK, so you've talked about my, so your parents really got you going. Your teachers really set you up. But what is it that's kept you going in the years since in terms of keeping you fired up for the politics and the campaigning and so on? Like, you know, because there are easier routes in life to take, aren't there? Yeah. And it's not been yeah. easy at times. So... 
No, but I mean, I, I, you know, this was all, when I was very young, obviously, this was all instinctive and intuitive, wasn't it? Um, but I, you know, I then became intellectually convinced of certain ideas and I read quite a lot when, you know, when one of the things that people don't often understand about university at the, uh, the tail end of the 70s and through the 80s and so on, and presumably before, but was that it, when I went and studied English uh, literature, I didn't spend a huge amount of time studying English literature in the formal sense, but I did spend an awful lot of time reading and arguing and thinking about ideas. So it was this incredibly fertile intellectual period. I read voraciously, I thought about, I, I was challenged, you know, there was no group think in those days, you know, you'd kind mm -hmm. of turn up and say something naive in the student union and everybody just like shout at you and bark at you and say, have you read this? And you didn't sort of, oh, I haven't read anything. And, um, and, I, and so I, I, I became intellectually convinced um, in my instance uh, of the need for left-wing politics um, in a particular way and so on. But it, was, it wasn't just a question of um, being a kind of mindless activist. That's the point I'm trying to make. Mm -hmm. I thought about everything that I believed and then thought I should do something about it. So it was that way around rather than just being an activist. And there was an awful lot of people on the left at that time who, in my mind, were simply activists in a kind of posturing way. And actually, you know, uh, it, what I really enjoyed was the taking on the ideas and putting myself, recognising that I was a mere dot in history, you know, that I was no one. And that all of the people before me in the history of, of, of both uh, the UK, but the history of the world had fought so that somebody like me could go to university and so on. And that gave me a real sense of uh, humility. So it combined with my arrogant know-it-all, I can change the world stance with a certain sense of standing on the shoulders of giants. So I've retained that. I mean, that's been my approach to life. I try and act in good conscience and I try also not to be closed-minded. So... You know, I've never yeah. uh, wanted to just be a kind of dogmatic person who says, I thought this when I was 19, I'm never going to read a book again. And I continue to think it. So I've tried to be open minded in my approach to politics and life. And so you had, it sounds like you had a lot of fun at university doing your stuff. They've been exposed to all those different ideas. Um, let's start talking about universities now, because obviously freedom of expression and freedom of uh, research and academic freedoms is a really is a topic you're very passionate about. Like, when do you think, or how do you think things have changed from your time at university? And what do you think, you know, caused that to change over time? Well, I mean, that's, you know, that's too big a question. But um, what has changed, I mean, although one of my first initiations into political life at university, uh, one of the big things that I got involved in, which I suppose shows a certain consistency, was that I actually defended a member of the Federation of Conservative Students who there was an attempt at no platforming because of his views actually uh, on abortion as it happens. Uh, he was anti-abortion and I defended his right to have views and argued against him being closed down and silenced. Um, so no platform was being uh, starting to be used then, even in those days, although it was uh, usually confined to being used against the National Front and the far right, which, by the way, did seriously exist. I mean, I was at Warwick University and in Coventry at the time, there was actually a genuine sense of fear for uh, uh, Asian uh, and black communities who were being firebombed. And, you know, the National Front was an enormous force. You know, there was hundreds of them. You just go out and you see loads of people who were openly fascist. I mean, people think he's not the same now, despite what everybody said. So you had this sort of sense of uh, a real struggle going on. Um, but politics, I, I think when I said about people reading and politics, I mean, the point was that you, you, you had every, I mean, everybody, general meetings would attract over a thousand people every week. Everybody I knew was involved in politics. But mm -hmm. you would also talk, this is about how you disagree, you'd have arguments with members of the Conservative Party, you'd have arguments with the Labour students, you'd have arguments with the Socialist Workers Party, with the Lib Dems, the, the Women's Liberation uh, Group uh, split into four at one point. So there was a variety, I mean, there was all sorts of splits yeah. and those things are caricatured 
these days as kind of these all these different myriad revolutionary organizations all these different groups but the fascinating thing about all of those splits and there was a very much sectarianism and name calling was that actually we were all passionately committed to politics and we took each other seriously yeah. so what happened to us was that we argued all the time and people would try and convince you to join their group so they didn't just label you so that's an interesting shift yeah now i think that what has subsequently occurred of course is that any intellectual commitment to free speech has been eroded but largely what's happened is, is that um we've seen the emergence of victim politics and the emergence of identity politics which has formed a toxic mix and so politics rather than it being about ideas has started to be about the who has the right to say something about those ideas and people uh, representing those ideas which in some ways has then personalized it so then instead of you um everybody from all these different groups having a row about how you'd fight racism or what the nature of racism was or what caused racism and having this kind of intellectual but on the other hand very urgent discussion because you could see that racist violence was a real problem in the local area and so you weren't just playing games but it was nonetheless an intellectual approach to the subject because you wanted to understand the best way of tackling it mm -hmm. these days people would say um you know as a white person i'm not allowed to have that argument and that racism is dictated in a very narrow and prescriptive way by particular people because of their identity, because of their skin color. And actually that's closed down the debate, but also made it much more narcissistically personal in a way, because it means that, you know, I would be saying I as a woman, and then if you said something I disagree with, I'd say, I find that offensive and that's meant to shut you up. So we wouldn't have that over overarching discussion that's been incredibly destructive, I think. And do you think, do you think we can turn that back? Do you think it is possible to move the terms of debate away from that? Or do you okay. think yeah. we've lost it? Or? No, well, I mean, I got to hope so. Cause it's my life's work. But, um, you know, my, in the last two decades, that's what my intention has been to try and salvage this uh, this world of public intellectual life as something for everybody by the way uh, you know intellectual life mm. is not uh, something that's confined to the university sector just in case anybody thinks that but the, the world of public politics and i mean with a, a small p the world where everybody's voices are able to participate in the discussions should be what we're all aspiring to now we're up against the challenge and we're facing some of the more the most serious uh, challenges to free speech we've ever had because if you think about what happens now is even the right to have a debate is being challenged I mean that's what cancel culture means it we are effectively being warned that if we say the wrong thing that our reputations will be dragged through the mud our livelihoods will be removed from us or mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know we'll be sullied with <laughs> terrible labels and called awful names and that leads to an atmosphere of self-censorship and people being very nervous about what they're saying and walking on eggshells. And that is, you know, an atmosphere that is akin to, you know, a kind of totalitarian regime. Uh, you know, we kind of often think about kind of the Stalinist uh, uh, countries mm -hmm. dominated by Stasi spies and so on and so forth. And, you know, it's such a terrible vision. And that you know that we were all glad i mean i was on the far left and i was delighted to see the collapse of the berlin wall because that yeah. regime was propped up by terror and fear and people not being able to speak freely and, also, and, that, and the, way, the way they encouraged everybody to report on it exactly other, exactly yeah, yeah 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 and, and we've got it going on now to some extent that not to any i'm not really right. assisting to the same scale but that, no, but it's that an one thing that was about calling people out yeah that's, actually, that's when, what it's like and when we yeah. did the polling, and like you said, it's not just in the universities or in the corporations, because when we did our polling um, before the launch campaign for Common Sense, and we did one of those, you know, we got one of those professionally done 2,000 people polls, nationally weighted, 80% of people were saying they felt they had to walk on eggshells about a whole load of issues now, which is really sad, isn't it? Because how else do you, how else do you get exposed to different ideas? Or indeed, how else do you develop your thinking if you're not allowed to be exposed to 
different yeah. ideas in the first place. And and if you if you are in a situation, um, I mean that's spot on because. But if you're in a situation where your campaign is called a campaign for common sense, sometimes when you have these discussions about cancel culture or free speech, immediately those people that you know people who disagree with me will not say oh, I disagree with you. They'll say. Oh yeah, we know that if you are an ardent campaigner for free speech, it's because you want the freedom to be a bigot, racist, homophobic lunatic, right? I mean, that's you know, about to read. Or they and they say you're you're claiming there's a crisis of free speech because a group of extremists want the to monopolise the public discourse, and and we simply want to open it up to everyone. But that's not true because your campaign is called the campaign for common sense, and. The most commonsensical attitudes are now written off as verboten, as dodgy, as the ones which we're not allowed to hear. But because before you've even uttered your commonsensical views, you're written off as somebody who has probably got the wrong views, mm. you immediately make people think twice about speaking out because they're anxious, because nobody wants to be described as a racist or a a, a, a misogynist or any of these things and people then start not understanding what the rules of the game are and I, I somebody once described to me about China that they you know they said well actually in China there isn't always open censorship you know especially if you're a, a westerner living in China you can't the censors don't come around and close you down but they said it's a bit like doing backstroke which is you don't know when you're going to hit your head Right on the, and you're yeah. kind of constantly like watching over your shoulder and then there's a kind of arbitrary nature to it which is what you might say one week as acceptable the following week somebody from the chinese communist party turns up and says close that down right it's a, and that's yeah. what authoritarianism's like it's viciously unpredictable and it creates an arbitrary atmosphere. now let's be honest i think it's like that here now and right. it's not because I'm saying, oh, the UK is like China. But what I'm saying is there are elements of that which have become the norm today. And people are looking over their shoulder in case they bang their head doing backstroke. And there is an arbitrary nature to saying something you think is just a common sense statement and everybody kind of leaping on you. And it then being quite a scary atmosphere for people. And the important thing that you also said was over my years i have changed my mind now how have i changed my mind either because i've read books with different opinions in it or because mm -hmm. i've had arguments with people yeah people have had yeah. the, the look me in the eye and tell me i was wrong and tell me that i should look at something else i should think of it differently and as a consequence and they didn't intimidate me they just argued with me and that made me think and then it went off so the more exposed we are to as wide a variety of ideas as we can be the more likely we are to develop and mature our ideas and change them potentially so you've obviously committed a huge chunk of your you know your professional and, and personal life to, to defending ideas including as you said you know ideas and people that you don't agree with um that can't have been easy for you at times like obviously when you're in when you're out in public doing your thing you know it comes because you've got affected how, how what have been some of the negative impacts on you over the years well, um, or has it not remotely bothered I, you? Are you one of those? No, things of course it. No, no, no. Because yeah. it's bothered me. Because it's bothered. Me. I think it's actually feeling. It's a sense of injustice when people caricature your view. I, mm. I, that's the thing that drives me most. I mean, you know, I've I've certainly made. Um, it's not been a great career choice. I mean, I've, made, <laughs> I've never made any money. You know, I'm very lucky that the Academy of Ideas has kept going for two decades, but every year I think it's going to go bankrupt because it's always a struggle. Um, so it's not, it doesn't make you popular is the point I'm making. I yeah. mean, uh, that that's, but the, the things which really upset me are when people argue or say, and it's taken as good coin, that the only reason I have my views is because they're bought. There's yeah. this horrible phrase called grifter. And people mm -hmm. will suggest that you're kind of like just after a fast book. Yeah. I mean, it irritates me because I've never had any money. And it secondly irritates me because it really reduces ideas to this uh, kind of transactional, whereas I'm very serious and earnest about ideas. Yeah, the yeah, idea yeah. that somebody could come up and kind of buy me off. Um, but it's not just me because it's generally 
that atmosphere of you know a, a kind of conspiratorial atmosphere which is that ideas that somebody doesn't understand they assume must be paid for that irritates me and yeah. what upsets me is then when you have ideas in good faith and they you know so the obvious one of most recent times is the european referendum in which i wasn't a particularly ardent eurosceptic before the referendum i mean i was eurosceptic but i simply voted in the referendum i was quite enthusiastic about leaving the european union i didn't think that that vote would go through as leave um yeah. I, I spoke at a few things i started to get annoyed at the fact that people who were voting leave even before the referendum uh, happened were being caricatured as being uh, ill-informed and stupid and and potentially racist mm -hmm. but when it uh, then um brexit was voted for and the next three years there was this concerted attempt at delegitimizing the people who voted leave by calling them you know like the equivalent of the britain's deplorables you know knuckle dragging xenophobic uh, yeah. backward stupid racist and in the course of that i now am routinely described particularly on social media but more seriously in other publications i have to say as a fascist enabler uh, uh, you know and uh, somebody who's uh, allowed a kind of new form of nazism to emerge uh, somebody who hates immigrants i mean these are things which are an anathema to my political tradition and my political beliefs yeah. and somehow i can't ever escape it because the way that politics works at the moment is through delegitimizing labels and a, a kind of series of, uh, uh, it, it makes it absolutely impossible to get out of. Because if you say that's not true, they say you would say that, wouldn't say that. you? Yeah. And so that, of course, upsets me because I, I don't want people to think that I am the very kind of person that I've actually been opposed to for many years. Way through. So you talked about, um, if it's okay, we're going to go to some of the questions from um, the audience now. So I've got a question here from Neil. You know, you talked about how you've changed your mind over time from arguing or reading or whatever. So um, who, what or how um, most challenged an opinion that you held? Can you think of a particular book or a person that had a particular big influence on you, a few you held over the years? Well, I... Um... You know, I was, when I went to university, um, anti-abortion, um, uh, pro-life, as I, I would have called it then. And I changed my position on that, uh, having uh, had lots of arguments. I mean, I didn't, that didn't happen without some struggle, I have to say, in, in my own conscience, because I understood why, you know, and I came... Um, so I wasn't just um, anti-abortion because I was from a Catholic family. I was very passionate about that and... I, I know now, I at least understand the sensitivities around that issue, but I did change my mind on that. But I changed my mind because I, I thought about it and I had important discussions with uh, fellow uh, uh, women, it, it wasn't just women, but uh, at a university, and it made me realise I had a very simplistic way of viewing it. But that morally charged question of when life begins, my goodness, I mean, that was kind of a big one. Um, but I also... I think that, you know, if you can't have been involved in, you know, I, I was involved in revolutionary politics for many years. And, you know, the party that I was in, the Revolutionary Communist Party, closed down in, in the end of the 1990s because it basically said it's not going to happen. I mean, that's quite a big one, isn't it? And yeah. even though the, I was from a Trotskyist background, these are kind of points of, uh, I, I understand people will be going, oh God, who cares? But it was, it was an important thing because when the collapse of the Soviet Union happened and the Stalinist regimes, because I was from a Trotskyist organisation, I, I was delighted that happened. But it also became a crisis for the broader left because people basically said, look, the whole project of a left-wing alternative to capitalism is, is over. And Margaret Thatcher famously said, there is no alternative. And you had to, I had to really sit and think what does that mean for somebody who's identified yeah. as somebody on the left for all these years? And then the other thing that I've changed my... And so I haven't, by the way, abandoned that, uh, you know, Marx's help, very helpful philosophical outlook, and I still consider myself on the left. I've become less obsessed with that label. And, you know, I'm yeah. obviously not involved in the Revolutionary Party because there is no Revolutionary Party. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, when I, I, I won't say ever... What, what, but was I, it that made you think, what was it made you decide it wasn't going to happen in the end? No, because was I there remember, a moment? No, I'm, I'm, say, I'm saying it, it, so what happened was, was that you have to have people who want a revolution to happen. You can't, you can't just go on 
right? Yeah. And so yeah. what I'd say is, is that capitalism as a social system promises the universal improvement for everybody, it promises equality, fraternity, uh, uh, you know, and, and liberty for everyone and can't deliver. It also can't deliver in a systematic way, I don't think, um, uh, the kind of lifestyle, living standards and, and, and so on that everybody needs around the world, right? So I think there's a more yeah. rational way of organising things. But it was, but I don't want to go back to feudalism and I'm aware yeah. of the fact, so this is quite a big shift, isn't it? I, uh, in fact, Marx himself was pro the market. He just said it he didn't was. go far enough. And what I'd say is it doesn't go far enough. But in order for people to say, we need to move it further forward, um, you, you have to have a sense of progress and future orientation and believe in, in uh, people having more. We now live in a society in which actually, uh, largely, people have become obsessed with sustainability, environmentalism and wanting less. And left-wingers are associated with kind of trying to cut down on people having things. And I don't like that aspect of yeah. contemporary left. So, you know, one of the big changes that's happened to say to Neil is that I've become less obsessed with the labels. You know, I everybody else is obsessed with labeling me, uh, particularly uh, in recent times, but as I've become better known. But I, you know, when I started uh, teaching and when I, especially when I did my PGCE, I was told by left-wing activists, my peers on the left, that people who cared about um, knowledge and standards and knowledge for its own sake and standards were, you know, Thatcherite free marketeers who, who were elitists who hated the working class. And I said, don't be ridiculous. And they said that my attitude, which was knowledge for its own sake and the highest standards for every child and, you know, eaten for all rather than abolish eaten yeah. and everyone have a rubbish education, was uh, that they told me I sounded like a Daily Mail uh, right winger. And I said, <laughs> and I said, so be it. That's what I think. I think the world has changed rather than than me on yeah. that. Well, they, they they clearly haven't read any Gramsci, and they clearly and, haven't they? read any, any. I mean, Marx. They haven't Marx read any. Uh, they haven't, yeah. to be, the frankly, the, the truth is, they haven't read anybody. anybody. But the point is, is it was something which the left and right agreed on, by the way, which yeah. was education for all, <laughs> yeah. right? So yeah. and, and knowledge for its own sake. This was a great enlightenment gain, which was hardly a matter of contentious argument amongst either people on who were leading to the left or the right. But in recent times, it has become. So all I'm saying is, is that... I was about to say, with the Michael Gove stuff as well, it's funny yeah, how he walks together exactly, exactly, exactly. I just think that, therefore, what I have most changed about is that despite everybody else saying it, I no longer feel the need to declare my left-right credentials yeah. all the time. Although it annoys me when people try and dismiss my views by saying that I've gone to the right. That's the way the left try and deal with me. Oh, you've just become a Tory, and I haven't. But it makes it, a, it's hard to negotiate that. Anyway, I'm, just, I'm rambling. No, thanks. So um, actually linking to that, we've had a question in from Amanda saying, um, in my career as a teacher, I was massively inspired by Ken Robinson, because you brought up education. I was massively inspired by Ken Robinson, who sadly died recently. Who is your education hero? Do you have an education hero? Oh, I don't know that I have. That's terrible. Should we, say, should we say it's Michael Gove then? No. No, that, okay. Um, oh. It's it's funny that you, yeah I don't know I, I I yeah not I can't think of an individual in that way Sorry. but no I know but it's I, I I'm feeling slightly inadequate um but anyway can I just say that I didn't find Ken Robinson my inspiration in fact I argued with him on occasion and I thought that the problem with Ken Robinson by the way was an incredibly inspiring man mm. and that mm. you know we were all familiar with the work that he did. Um, and he, he, he was rightly known to be somebody who really cared passionately about education. But I felt that some of his work on creativity actually was very disparaging of the need for rather boring things like doing work and studying hard. And, so, you know, he yeah. himself would, um, I felt, caricature those people who uh, believed in 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 standards and discipline in, in educational terms as kind of like old-fashioned and stuffy and that he was the creative one whereas I've always been of the opinion that the way that you acquired the ability to be creative was by doing a very lot of boring hard work first so you know the great uh, musician has to have really done you know the great pianist has to have practiced on yeah. uh, their scales on the piano in boring 
repetitive detail before they can play well, rather than just saying, you are creative, play the piano. And anyone who's ever had to listen to a young person who hasn't done the practice play the piano will know how excruciating that can be. Well, actually, my youngest had her first ever piano lesson tonight, so it's quite nice to be here doing this with you uh, as an alternative. It's probably more tuneful. Um, thank you for that. Okay, I've got a question now about, and we're going to change the topic, about the BBC, okay? And this is a question from May in Luton, and she says, um, I'm going to paraphrase it, basically, is there any way back to the BBC, do you think, given how they have shut down discussion? Yeah, I, I, I try. I'm, I'm one of the very... I, 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 the last bastion calls of people who would defend the BBC and I try desperately hard to defend the kind of Rethian aspect of the BBC from by which I mean uh, a commitment to impartiality but also a commitment to high stand, a, a kind of educational missionary uh, position in a way missionary yeah. in the sense of educating and um, by for example um, say we don't care how many people watch this but it's a brilliant play and we're going to put it on anyway but from the point of view of BBC News, which is always the, and they don't do that, by the way, they don't do the arts as well as they should do. They've, they've basically developed a rather sniffy attitude to high culture, um, imagining that the masses won't get it. So they're kind of like, uh, um, that, that, that's its own kind of um, inverted snobbery, which irritates mm -hmm. me. But I think that the, the criticism, the defund the BBC kind of, crowd uh, 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 and you campaign the people who say that the BBC are just utterly beyond hope are really talking about the news output in particular and the current affairs output which I think was shown to be in capable of understanding what anybody in the country was thinking particularly brought into relief around Brexit as so Brexit did so many things which was that it, I, you know, I was a regular panellist on the Moral Maze for 20 years. There was always a, a, on Radio 4, I've done lots of particularly Radio 4. I'm part of that kind of BBC Radio 4 crowd. I, I've never worked for the BBC, but, you know, I, I've done it. And I've, I've watched a kind of increasingly uh, group thing mentality emerge where they don't even know they're doing it. So they just adopt the most fashionable uh, ways of looking at things. So they're obsessed with identity politics at the moment. So yeah. can they get out of it? So you get a new uh, uh, director general comes in and he says, I'm going to change it all. The first thing he says, I'm going to, I'm going to stop left-wing comedians criticizing the government and have right-wing comedians. And he said, oh, you're missing the point. So it doesn't matter whether you're left or right. What you want is brilliant satire that doesn't hector and lecture everybody. And I don't care whether they're left wing or right wing, but make them be, make them go beyond the obvious. In other words, yeah. not simply spout their prejudices, but to really try and be funny. I also noticed that he's overturned the decision on the proms and that's, we can all cheer that. But this, nonetheless, I can assure you that the content of the proms programme will be achingly right on. They will be so self-consciously worried, uh, never mind what happens on the last night of the proms, what about the rest of the night of the proms? Yeah. They have been for the last few years in a state of self-loathing, basically saying, oh, we're all too uh, pale and stale and white and, and male. And so what we've got to do is uh, make sure that everything has a, an appeal for young people for, and then they patronise young people because they assume that that doesn't mean classical music. So they're constantly yeah, yeah. tripping over themselves. So I am now rather more pessimistic about whether they can pull themselves through this despite the rhetoric at the moment. But I wouldn't join a campaign to defund them. I think that's different. I think the ideal of the BBC is important to retain and hold on to and fight for for a bit longer. So, I mean, for me, if I think of um, a programme that sums up the best of the BBC, um, that has never really been done by commercial TV. I'd probably go for, and some people might laugh at this, but like Jules Holland, play it with Jules Holland. You never know what you're going to get with Jules Holland. And I can think of a number of episodes of that that have literally changed my life in terms of the music they've exposed me to and then I've gone and explored it. What, what for you is a programme that sums up the best of the BBC, if you could pick one example? Actually, Jules Holland is a really good example, but I, I'm afraid I'm, um, I, I'm, I'm very much kind of Radio 4 on that. So it's mm -hmm. like... it. It, it used to be start the week, but it's in our time. I mean, Melvin Bragg's in our time gives you every week 45 minutes in which you basically get a 
mini little way in it's like for anybody who feels oh i don't i'm not educated enough and i'm not going to sit yeah. and read every philosophy book in the world i can assure you i'm not and i don't read all of those books and yeah. so i can listen to something by melvin bragg when he has guests on and it doesn't insult my intelligence but it also gives me an accessible way of understanding anything from you know greek mythology through to astrophysics and and, and so those things are very i i love that um but I, I don't want to be too po-faced about this because, you know, I, I do love Strictly Come Dancing. I do mm. love Jules Holland. <laughs> yeah. But I used to love, and this is more the point, I used to love and diligently watch the news and Newsnight and mm -hmm. Panorama. And I now can't bear getting my news output from those key programmes. So often they are so jaundicedly biased and i don't mean that everyone is biased, but they they don't they can't hear themselves they have no idea they think that the majority of people in the country are beyond you know they can't understand the outlook of these backward people around the country who don't get it rather than having some reflective thought about the fact that possibly they need to get out more they have they drip condescension and they and when they then think we'll talk to the working classes, um, they do so by talking very slowly in words mm -hmm. of two syllables and having big graphs, i.e. they insult the intelligence of people rather than giving them difficult, complicated uh, ways of understanding an issue where you realise, oh, there's 16 different versions of this truth. I've got to now work it out and the BBC will give them me. That's very important for me. And, and, and you, you sort of mentioned Brexit a few times now in terms of, uh, you know, something which showed how people weren't happy with what being offered. And um, we've had two people ask um, questions about Trump. So I've got a question from Paul in Scotland. Um, Trump or Biden, if you had to pick between the two, if you, if you had the joys of being an American voter. God, I really, I really wouldn't want to choose, right? I, I mean, this is a shoddy shower. Um, so... Of course, I can't bear the people who are supporting Biden to win because I'm afraid that the Democrats at the moment represent some of the most egregious aspects of everything, you know, that kind of um, uh, identity politics way of, of understanding the world, some of the most damaging aspects of the divisiveness we've uh, seen associated with uh, the racializing of society which they have adapted to, adopted and, and encouraged, yeah. um, and some of the chaos that's going on. But Trump is an absolutely, you know, Trump's existence is a, an affront to political life in many ways, but he's a, a result of the failure of mainstream politics to create new parties or new opportunities. And we all understand why people voted for Trump the last time round. Well, I, yeah. I think many of us do um, as, a, as a, a kind of real slap across the face, a kind of taking back control moments in America for people yeah. saying, we're not doing what you thought you, we were going to do. We'll, we'll show you. However, Trump's capacity as a leader has been revealed to be, you know, very limited. But uh, yeah, so I, I, I'd hate to choose. And I read a really good article, this thing about where people um, ask, say, what do you read? I read a really good article um, during the week, and I think the Atlantic, but where basically said, we shouldn't allow politics to dumb us down so much that we say we have to choose either of those two, because maybe we don't, and maybe you shouldn't vote. And I think that there's something in that, right? I think there is something in that, you know, mm. that, 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 that it's a terrible choice. But I, yeah, I can't stand the Democrats winning, but I'm scared of Trump's inability to hold things together. Just on what's happening in the cities, just on the Trump question, by the way, yeah. um, you know, the the way that the uh, those who act in the name of Black Lives Matters, but we know, you know, I don't want to, uh, that, that particular organisation, um, whether they're involved in it or not, but certainly the sentiments of Black Lives Matters, you know, I went on one of the Black Lives Matters demonstrations in good faith at the beginning. So, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm you know, an anti-racist, but what's, uh, this has become in terms of, you know, almost like Chinese Communist Party struggle camps and going around demanding that um, mm. uh, 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 people take the bend the knee or give uh, salutes. The, the dangerous and vicious way 
that uh, skin color is being used, the unconscious bias training that's being imposed on uh, university lecturers all outside of the administration in America and in the UK, by the way. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. the way that's flared up into a violence, that toxic atmosphere in America is very frightening. And I think that Trump probably will gain from saying that he won't tolerate it, yeah. even though he himself has is a toxic type. Yeah, and actually sort of linked to that. So there's a question here from Douglas saying, like, do you think the slogan Black Lives Matter is racist? And a question be, do you think anything positive can come out of it in terms of um, the way things have gone so far? Well, I mean, first of all, I don't think I don't think the slogan Black Lives Matter is racist. I think that, you know, black lives do matter. And I understand even that it is an attempt, you know, its origins or attempt at saying in case you have forgotten, because some people have black lives do matter. And also the very specific circumstance of America, where, by the way, uh, you know, there are some very different situations in America than there are in the UK and other places. And there is a, a serious problem, in my opinion, of um, police brutality and a criminal justice system, not, not even the police brutality, but a criminal justice system, which disproportionately means that if you are a young black male in America, your chances of getting through to any kind of a life are very limited. And that is not because of anything to do with them, but because of the way things are set up. And, I, and, and it's more complicated than I'm saying, but I yeah, just wanted yeah. to stress that. However, however, what I think is um, uh, racist or, 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 or racially divisive is the, the move away from Martin Luther King's notion that we should judge people based on their character, not their skin color. And as you know, Martin Luther King's dictum that we should do that is now considered racist itself. We are told mm. that if you can't see, if you aren't focusing on skin color, you are basically uh, unconsciously biased. You are exhibiting um, white supremacy or you know, a microaggression. That obsessive focus on identity and on skin color in particular is so damaging and divisive and dangerous. And it's not just in America. I mean, it's here. Mm. And when you ask me if any good can come of it, I think we can see how very dangerous it is when we have an establishment that won't stand up for yeah. values it believes in or is intimidated. So it is extraordinary to me that a government, regardless of what kind of government, but a government that claims to be conservative and wants to conserve, has been rather weak in terms of its uh, defence of, for example, the statues or the mm. British Library mm. or the British Museum. Um, I cannot believe that a war on history and a war on the past that is conducted in such a philistine, destructive and nihilistic way as, as we are seeing at the moment in the name of anti-racism can go on challenge because people are frightened to challenge it in case they get called a racist. That seems to be great disappointment from this administration. It also seems to me that part of this is a reassertion by a particular type of elite who run cultural institutions, universities, but also, you know, the big tech companies, a lot of corporates yeah. are doing this where they're basically saying, we will decide what is an acceptable for form of thought and citizens. And anyone who doesn't go along with this is going to be cast out as a backward troll. And when they do that, they often mean the millions of people who won't go along yeah. with this sort of orthodoxy. And guess what? They're the white working class often, right? Now they're not just the white working class because it's, this is very important because actually it is, people from different ethnic minorities who can't bear the fact they're lumped together as BAME and all treated as some indiscriminate blob. But nonetheless, the majority of ordinary people in this country are white. This is just a fact. And therefore, when you basically say that white privilege means that all white people in this country are privileged and need to be re-educated and told what's what, this is an assault on the majority of ordinary people who are sitting there thinking, what the hell happened there? All I said was when you said Black Lives Matters, I'd said all lives matters. And the next minute I'm being denounced as a fascist. I don't know what happened. 
And it also, I think ultimately it's counterproductive, isn't it? Because it ends up pulling people apart rather than trying to find common ground. And it, Absolutely. And a, yeah. Um, listen, I've got um, two people asked a really good question. Um, it's Alex and also Maxine asked the same kind of question, which is, um, so we talked about politics. So how do you feel about your peerage? And what difference do you hope you're going to make in, in the House of Lords? And I'm going to sort of, if we can stick to two or three minutes on that and then we've got a final yeah, question. Sure. Yes, I, great. yeah, I, um, so I was completely shocked when I was offered it. And as somebody who has long campaigned for the abolition of the House of Lords, it was pretty obvious that if I said yes, it would seem like hypocrisy. And I understand that people will mm -hmm. think that. Um, it was made clear to me that if I wanted to carry on, that there was no strings attached and that there was an awareness that I believed in the abolition of the House of Lords. And this would not <laughs> be a barrier <laughs> to me saying yes. Um, I also, um, so what I feel about it is, what? I can't believe it. Are you kidding me? And I can't get used to it. Why did I take it though? I took it because I'm, I'm at, you know, I'm older now and I realise, oh my God, this is an opportunity, potentially at least to have a platform that is quite, a, that, this really is a privilege. Um, I didn't take it because I'm going to get uh, paid an allowance in the day, as people think. I didn't take it because I fancied the title. I'm embarrassed by it. I took it because I thought it might give me the opportunity to give greater voice to the anti-democratic trends that I've witnessed in the country over recent years. And so that I could make as loud a noise as possible about um, free speech and cancel culture and draw attention to as I've just argued, you know, ensuring that we don't have a war on history and we don't allow racially divisive uh, identity politics to become the norm, but that there's some challenge to it. And I suppose from somebody from the left. And mm -hmm. then I've got some pet issues that I'm really interested in. Um, education being one of them, debating in schools, which I'm very passionate about. And also people might not know this, but prison reform, um, which is something that I've always prison education specifically, which I hope to also be able to make a contribution to. Um, if the House of Lords is abolished during my tenure, this will not be a bad thing. I, I don't believe that a, an unelected second chamber should exist, but whilst it exists, and when I was given this extraordinary offer, I thought, go for it. And so you, you talk about the importance of debating and, and education, and of course, what is education really about other than learning stuff and disagreeing and arguing and learning from one another but still getting on so to try and wrap this all together you know we called this session how to disagree like so how do you think we can disagree better i don't and again i, I don't just mean you know people engaged on social media or whatever like what do you think the, what do you think the things we need to do now to enable us to disagree better in the workplace at home down the pub whatever it is i think that we have to uh, look at every single person that we argue with as though they're ourselves that sounds very narcissistic <laughs> right um by which i mean which is never look down on anyone and take everybody's arguments seriously and assume that they are just like you arguing in good faith so start from the presumption that the person that disagrees with you or that you disagree with is just like you they mean it they genuinely mean it and so your job my job is to try and persuade them, but also to listen to them. And so consequently, we don't personalize it. So you think that's interesting. You believe that, I believe this, let's work out whether, where we can go with that. One of the things that I think is most dangerous at the moment is a kind of tit for tat cancel culture. Now I understand yeah. this, you know, you kind of can feel very aggrieved that um, a particular cultural leftist in, is, is sort of able to get people uh, sacked or, or or discredited or you know go around kind of demanding that people um as uh, you know compelled speech that they actually say what they don't mean by saying that they go along with these orthodoxies and then you get an opportunity to get one of them sacked you say yes schadenfreude you know i'm now they've said something stupid on on social media so i'm now going to really go after them well this is spiraling lower and lower and lower isn't it this is a disastrous mm. way to behave so I think we have to resist the temptation of imitating that which we most despise in the way that arguments are conducted today and to hold our nerve more. I think we have to reclaim 
uh, ideas into the sphere of objective ideas and to, therefore not uh, you know the, what's the cliche you know play the play the ball not the man this is yeah. so important you know just because you disagree with someone doesn't mean that you have to morally think of them as evil you know to be to be wiped out to you know the sort of like you apologize or else you know denounce this or else i'll get you sat i mean this absolute ferocity of the way people go for each other you know i think you say well you've got a different idea i'd like to understand where that idea came from and argue about it but always knowing that that person is just like you they're hopefully like you now if they're not like you and they're trying to get you sacked i understand the temptation but we should never do it. Never, ever, ever go as low as them. That is a really great place to finish. Thank you so much. Um, that's really, really been interesting. And I'm sorry to people watching that haven't been able to get through all the questions. I'm clear we've had loads and loads of questions coming in. People are very keen to get your view on stuff. Um, thank you for your time. Um, well, to everyone watching now, we'll, we'll get this uploaded online. Um, ASAP if people want to watch it back and we'll take what we'll do Chris we'll take some clips out to misrepresent you and then try and get you cancelled of course that's, okay. that's it yeah, yeah. that's it that'll get us some headlines that's perfect <laughs> um, um, but Mark also to anyone who has asked questions that we haven't got through I mean my my email at the Academy of Ideas is open so um, yeah, I know but seriously you know email yeah. me and, and I can always get back to you that way so if it's if, if, if you want to kind of um, pursue anything again or clarify so really kind of go. Thank you. And thank you again to everyone for joining us tonight. And um, if you haven't yet signed up to receive um, our email alerts, um, please go to campaigncommonsense.com slash join hyphen us. And then you'll get first access to when we do more of these events. Claire, thank you once again. Thank you everybody for listening. And that's it for tonight. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>